with this video 9C, we're going to look at the Mycenaean culture and uh, its qualities and uh, there's a few things that may be a little bit different uh, than what you've read or um, heard about from other uh, history classes. Now your textbook will uh, cover some of this, page 41, 42 uh, in the first edition, 44 to 46 in the second edition, and 45 to 47 in the third edition. And there's only um, one or two questions on uh, page 47 in the course pack. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of stuff to unpack with the Mycenaeans, and it's all very recent. So that's kind of an exciting thing about this. Uh, it is a culture that in some ways we thought we knew s something about or a lot about, and uh, it's because we found a lot of things by them. We were able to read uh, the stuff they wrote. But as it turns out, um, we didn't have a complete story on the Mycenaeans. Okay, so what, have, what is it that we've known? Well, they were apparently a warrior culture that seemed to have come from the Balkan Peninsula, the mainland area. So if you remember, you have the Cycladics there in the islands of the Aegean, the Minoans, same area, and Crete, and a little bit on the shores of the Greek uh, or the Balkan Peninsula. Okay, so these Mycenaeans seem to have come in a little bit from the north, and they were a warrior culture. Now, some of these attitudes we might see in the Peloponnesian Peninsula uh, that will eventually become what we know as the Spartan culture. Okay, and we'll talk about that one later on. These folks appeared to value honor, uh, courage, battle craftiness, kind of reminds me of Klingons, right? They're just ready to go to battle, right? Uh, very patriarchal, male-dominated society. Uh, they worshipped sky gods, and they tended to live in these small independent city-state kingdoms. And it's very curious because they function like islands, even though they're on the land. And the city-state kingdom idea, something we will see later on, that uh, predominates medieval European culture. Okay. And they engaged in something called uh, Tourettics. That's uh, hand-hammered craftsmanship. Okay, so uh, you see these asterisks here. Uh, the reason I have them there is because the general notion, idea of what the Mycenaeans were was these patriarchal chest-thumping, uh, let's, let's get drunk and have a war with somebody and go fight and go in battle and it's a good day to die, that type of attitude. And in the last decade, so I mean like seven to ten years, they finally figured out where it is the Mycenaeans bury their dead, right? They've stumbled on a few, now they know what to look for, where to find these burial sites. And when we looked in the burial sites, we found things that um, we would expect to find, you know, for a warrior, you know, uh, armor and, you know, that sort of warfare stuff, spears and what have you. But then we found some things we didn't expect to find, but in hindsight we should have. They were preceded by the Minoans, and the Minoans was a very, uh, that, that culture was very refined. And what we found in these burial areas of these Mycenaeans, and I'm talking about the last decade here, are uh, things like um, suggested fine fabrics, uh, maybe perfume bottles, nicely scented things. Not the sort of stuff you would expect to find a knuckle-dragging troglodyte um, Klingon <laughs> buried in, okay? What we believe happened was these Mycenaeans had contact with the Minoans. And the Minoans exposed these uh, Mycenaeans, these kind of warlording type folks, to kind of finer things in life, you know, like nice, nice soft beds to sleep on, uh, uh, very um, comfortable clothing to wear, these sort of very sophisticated things, eating with utensils instead of grubbing with your hands and whatnot. So it appears that the Mycenaeans were far more refined 
on the account of contact with Minoans, maybe some other cultures, then your history books uh, th that you're going to read about. Okay, so this is new stuff, new new uh, discoveries that we're, we're making about the Mycenaeans. But the Mycenaean culture was, like I said, city-state. Almost everywhere you see a city is a king. Now, this is kind of an important thing to understand. These kings all saw each other. In other words, they saw all the other kings as their equal. Okay? Yes, some kings had more land. Some had more population. Some had more resources. Some had more wealth. Some had more um, geographical trade access or whatever it was. But it didn't matter. All these kings saw the other kings as equals. All right? What we have here is, um, I'm not asking you to buy into this trickle-down theory idea, but we do see an inkling of a sense of equality. Now, it only exists in this uppermost strata in Greek society, but nonetheless, this notion that uh, they're equals um, does seem to um, take root initially. Okay, so all these little uh, city-state kingdoms, a lot of uh, stuff going on. Uh, here uh, in terms of kings. Uh, here we see some, um, one of the wealthier ones is the treasury of Atreus. And we see these uh, structures here. Uh, notice that uh, triangular uh, shape uh, there at the entryway. Uh, this is what's called the corbelled interest, entrance. Now, uh, corbelling. Uh, corbelling is a decorative architectural technique. It's not structural. Post and lintel is definitely structural. Um, corbelling, well, it is structural in a sense, in that this brick right here doesn't have very much overburden to support, pretty much itself. Now, the minute you put something heavy right here, um, it's going to compromise the structure of that uh, area right there. So, uh, corbelling, while it's not, uh, while it's not. Um, best structure, it does allow opportunity for decoration. And we do see the Mycenaeans using this corbelling technique, uh, something that actually had been uh, used uh, to a lesser extent in Mesopotamian cultures. Also, notice the size of the person and how big these stones are here. We have basic post and lintel going on right here. Now, these big stones, uh, this is what we call Cyclopean masonry. Um, you know how People looked at Stonehenge and thought, or the pyramids, and thought, you know, humans couldn't do this. So how did they do it? They didn't. Aliens came down from space and did it for us. Well, uh, no, they didn't. And um, appear, apparently, uh, several centuries ago, people looked at these structures and thought, how did humans with no pulleys and ropes and all that stuff build these things? Uh, well, they didn't. Cyclops, these giant cyclops, built it for the humans. Not asking the question, would cyclops really consider doing this for people? Of course not. Uh, but anyway, we, we see a line gate entrance, post and lintel, but with some corbelling and a decorative stone uh, there above the lintel. Okay, a uh, fancy word, uh, one of them uh, for today is teretics. Uh, teretics is basically a technique we, uh, we've seen um, lost wax technique for making statues. Uh, teretics is hand hammered metal. So you take a piece of metal that you desire to shape and you have a form uh, that is either stone, wood, and then you hammer, you hammer it into shape. And it can be done uh, cold hammering or sometimes um, heated hammering, but usually cold is just more practical for, the, um, for some things. So, uh, teretics, this is something that you would imagine uh, the Mycenaeans are quite good at because, you know, weapons, right? Uh, here's a sheath for uh, some sort of a, a dagger type or knife weapon. And uh, yeah, not everybody is interested in making shields, helmets, and spears, and knives, and swords, and um, battle hammers. Some people wish to turn their teretic skills another direction. And what we find is with this uh, Mycenaean culture, some of the f most finely crafted jewelry in all of antiquity, okay, is just really quite incredible. And that brings me to these two folks, Heinrich and Sophia Schliemann. Now, um, 
Heinrich and Sophia, I'll start off with Heinrich. As a young boy, uh, his mother used to read as a bedtime story to him, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, particularly the Iliad. And um, he just loved that story, thought it was great. I feel a little, uh, <laughs> a little uh, less here because I think, you know, bedtime stories, I think of things like, you know, even Peter Pan is really out there. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of uh, Good Night Moon, <laughs> whatever. But uh, no, his mother read to him the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, but he grew up loving those. And he thought, you know, someday when I become an adult, I'm going to have my own um, adventure, just like Odysseus and you know, all that. So he does grow up, and he ends up leaving for America. Actually, I believe his brother comes to America first. And then he ventures out to a newly acquired territory of California at the behest, again, of his brother. So in 1849, you have the California Gold Rush, right? There's gold in California. Let's go there and get ourselves some gold and get rich. Didn't work like that, okay? So who did get rich out of the gold fields? The people who were already there. And it just so happened that uh, Heinrich Schliemann and you know a few others, they were already there. So he got good claims, apparently found gold quite easily there and became wealthy. Now there's some other folks that didn't, um, they didn't make their wealth that way. You know, Stanford made it through the railroads in California. Folgers realized everyone needs coffee to drink in the morning. And uh, Levi Strauss realized they needed really good trousers to wear. So people made their fortunes in that situation. Well, Heinrich made his kind of conventional way panning for gold, getting very lucky. And with some good investments, a few businesses didn't go well. Some went very well. Okay, so he's rich and he's traveling around with this idea of looking for the city of Troy. That's his goal. And while he's in Athens, uh, and, his, and again, his brother says, dude, you need to lighten up on this scholarly stuff. You need to get yourself a wife. He's like, no, I don't have time for that. Well, apparently what happens is uh, not exactly an ad in the newspaper, but the brother kind of <laughs> ends up finding um, someone who looks like a promising candidate, uh, matches her up with, um, uh, with Heinrich, and the two of them meet, and, uh, well, you know, I gotta say, first of all, he's, he's a nice guy, and he's really rich, so that's a plus for him. And as far as he's concerned, well, this lady, she is Greek, right, so he's obsessed about the Greek culture, and um, she knows the stories of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and the Theogony, and a, just a bunch of other Greek things. Oh my gosh, this is oh, great. So the two of them get married and uh, they're, they're quite happy with each other and they decide let's find Troy. And so they find a very promising spot. Seems like it's good. Now what's funny is that it ends up not being Troy. It ends up being the other city in the story, uh, which is Mycenaean, right? Okay. Um, while they are digging, and the way this works is you hire a contractor get rights to dig in a certain area, hire a contractor. Contractor goes out and he hires workers. Now, if a worker finds an artifact, oh, this looks interesting, okay, uh, then the contractor uh, documents it, and then uh, Heinrich uh, gets it, uh, you know, the guy in charge here, he gets it assessed for how much it's worth. He gets his cut, which is a lot of it, the contractor gets his cut, which is a little bit in terms of how much it's worth, and then the guy who found it with a shovel and pick, he gets a tiny, a few cents, uh, uh, pennies to the dollar is his percentage. Okay, so on one occasion, um, they were digging, and the story, this is one of the stories, possibly apocryphal, we don't know, but it's a kind of a, it seems to be something that definitely could have happened this way. Um, Sophia appears to have been um, with the contractors and uh, Heinrich when um, uh, she looks at the ground, sees something, steps on it, and then tells Heinrich, Heinrich, why do you have everyone working today? 
And he's looking at something. Wah, wah. What do you mean? It's a holiday. Holiday? What, what, what holiday? It's your birthday today. My birthday? No, my birthday. You always forget your birthday every year. Today's your birthday. And sort of a nod. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. He tells the contractors, um, yeah, um, tell everyone they have the day off. So everyone leaves and he asks her what the hell's going on. And uh, she reveals to him something that's very much like this, a gold earring of obvious antiquity, obviously gold. Heinrich and Sophia by themselves. You see how this works? They don't have to share. <laughs> they start digging and they find more stuff. That's a lot of gold here. They find more stuff. And they find more stuff. And more stuff. And more things. It almost becomes unmanageable. Uh, he speculated that this jewelry that we see her wearing is the jewelry that belonged to Helen of Troy. Uh, we don't know that, but uh, it, Maybe it could have been somebody important at least. All right, well, uh, with all this stuff, uh, they couldn't go unnoticed. They tried to sneak it all out of Greece, but they couldn't. Greece said, come on, you got to keep some of it here. But nonetheless, Heinrich got uh, paid uh, pretty well for this, uh, this find. Uh, it's one of the largest gold treasure finds of the entire 1800s. Big deal. We see the themes of Mycenaean artwork. Hunting, hunting a bull, right? Not, not, not something you'd see in the Minoan culture. Um, and also uh, themes of warfare being depicted. Again, something not seen in Minoan artwork. So this is definitely Mycenaean. Okay, and you could tell this hand-hammered, that uh, Turidic's technique. Uh, we believe this to be the funeral mask of Agamemnon, even. All right, so what a find this was. Now, along the way, they noticed that there were some uh, writing or carvings in this language, uh, which already this, uh, um, the Minoans had the linear, bay, uh, linear A, and so this one was, for the Mycenaeans was dubbed Linear B. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, don't know how to read it, but we could probably figure it out. The problem is, with most languages, is you don't know what language they're speaking. What, if you knew the language, you'd know the patterns to look for. But they don't know what language was being used here by the Mycenaeans. One of the things they were pretty darn sure and positive about is that uh, it was not a Greek language. They're 100% um, certain that the Greek language did not come down into the Greek Peninsula area until somewhere after the year um, 800 or maybe 900 at earliest, but definitely not during these times. Okay, so they've been trying to figure out how to crack this code. How do you read this uh, linear beam? And we're having no success at it. Then uh, World War II was going on, and then it comes to an end. And somebody has a brilliant idea of, hey, we got all these code breakers, cryptographers. Let's put them all together and have them uh, break the code, figure this out. That's a brilliant idea. So they get all these, these uh, you know, Enigma code breakers and whatnot, these folks that were breaking the various Japanese, German, Italian codes, whatever was being used to um, uh, find out the enemy's plans. Okay, so uh, they get all these code breakers together and they tell them, all right, these are the conventions that we find, or the patterns we find, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, good luck finding it. There's just one thing you need to know, and that is we're 100% sure it's not a Greek language. It's something that predates it. So have at it. So these cryptographers, they're working on it and um, you know, starting to work. But then there's one cryptographer who just has an insight, thinks, what if it was Greek? I don't know. Well, we'll give it a try. And looks at the Greek language, looks at linear B, and in less than half an hour, completely deciphered it. It was Greek <laughs> all along. So uh, with all the geniuses gathered here, it really was just a clever insight as to, wow, okay, we were wrong about this. It's an interesting theme that we have in history about some cultures, particularly the Mycenaeans. We have them figured out. They didn't speak a Greek language. 
because they predated, predated it. Uh, they were these chest-thumping warriors. And then we find out, oh, they did speak a language that is what we recognize as Greek, an ancestor to it. And um, they weren't so barbaric <laughs> as we once thought. So that's a neat thing about uh, history, is that we're always uh, having to modify uh, what we, as we learn new things, uh, we change our uh, perspective of it, of any given culture. Okay, following the Mycenaeans, we have something called the Late Bronze Age Collapse, which is quite interesting, but uh, it's getting more attention these days. Uh, it got almost no attention in the past. So, uh, looking at what we have here with the Mycenaean culture, they use a technique of corbeling uh, in their uh, decor decorative uh, works with the cyclopean masonry, right, or cyclops, you know, those maniac giants would build this for humans. Why would they do that? I don't know. Okay, <laughs> uh, but that's, that's the term that we use for those, that, that big stone masonry. Uh, Turetics, that's a hand-hammered technique that was used by the Mycenaeans. Uh, we see that uh, Heinrich and Sophia Schliemann uh, really uh, brought to light the Mycenaean culture uh, by, by just kind of going after it and discovering uh, some of the earliest artifacts from it. Uh, linear B is the writing system that they used and um, it does have a few symbols that rem are reminiscent of linear A. Uh, one of the points we should, uh, should mention is that the Mycenaeans had contact with the Minoans. That is new discovery in the last decade and they were a more sophisticated, evolved and progressive uh, culture than the, like I said, knuckle-dragging troglodytes thumping their chests looking for war that they have historically been painted as in your history books and even, even the textbook. doesn't say much about them, but now I'm thinking that in the textbooks in the next decade or so, we're going to see a lot more about the Mycenaeans and their culture. And that ends this uh, section number uh, 19, uh, 9C on the Mycenaeans. We'll look at the late uh, Bronze Age collapse uh, following this.